request everyone keep their joining with their microphones on mute. That includes me. Okay, so I think we'll make a start. Um, so welcome everybody, hi. And thank you for joining our Politics of Economics uh, webinar, uh, Economics in the Time of COVID-19 uh, webinar. This is our second event for um, the new year. And um, yeah, we're delighted to host um, Gerardo Serra for um, his talk on Marching with the Times, Quantification and Temporalities in 1960s Ghana. Uh, before we formally introduce our delighted distinguished guest, I just wanna um, just run through some housekeeping um, and tell you a little bit about our plans. So the, the, um, the sort of structure of the day of, of the session is to, um, Gerardo will, will present for approximately 25 minutes and then we'll open up for q and I'll lead in with some um, discussion questions. Um, the session is being recorded, so just keep that in mind. Uh, it's also being live streamed on YouTube. Um, uh, the, re the recording will be hosted on the Crash website, and that's where you can find um, all of the previous recordings of our events as well. So you're, you're more than welcome to comment uh, and, and send questions through the Zoom chat, which um, uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with and for people watching through YouTube, you can also send questions through the YouTube comments. Um, and we're also taking questions through Twitter. So if you if you are, um, if you want to post a conversation, start a conversation on Twitter, you're more than welcome to use the hashtag, hashtag PolEconCOVID19 or directly tagging us at PolEconCrash, double S. Um, so the co-host today is Cleo um, Shashanri Zaigush, who'll be um, helping with the moderation. Uh, just another reminder for people to keep their um, Microsofts on mute, just to help with the background noise and possible echoes. Um, so the, the, the only other thing I just want to um, announce is our next session, which might be of interest. Um, I'm just going to admit people in the waiting room. Um, on the 6th of April, we'll be hosting Quinn Slobodian of Wellesley College in conversation with Diane Cole from Cambridge to talk about the past and future of economic globalism. And the details of how to register are on our website, Politics of Economics. Um, and that's where you can sort of find the repository of our activities. So this is also an opportunity to send a warm word of thanks to Crash and especially to Una Jung for her help. So um, I think that's it for, 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 for that. And I just wanna, without further ado, introduce Gerardo. Um, Gerardo Serra, who's with us today, is a historian of 20th century West Africa at the Department of History at the University of Manchester. He's a historian of economics and of statistical knowledge with a focus on Ghana and Nigeria. Uh, he's the winner of the 2016 Joseph Dorfman Best Dissertation Prize um, awarded by the History of Economic Society. And uh, he's also one of the curators and creators of the excellent History of Economics podcast, Smith and Mark's Walk into a Bar. So thank you very much, Gerardo, for joining us. And um, without further ado, please um, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Christina, for the kind words of introduction. And uh, thanks to all the uh, colleagues and friends who apparently had nothing better to do on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, so uh, today's paper is part of a larger project, an attempt to interrogate, to reconstruct the political implications of different forms of quantification in, in 20th century Ghana. And uh, the lens uh, through which I'm going to explore this issue today is that of temporalities in the early post-colonial years. Um, the premise, really, of what I'm going to say is that in the early 60s, um, uh, 
the discourse of the first generation of African post-colonial leaders was filled with a sense of hope, of expectation, of progress. And even with what we might call uh, the acceleration of history, or at least the possibility that uh, an acceleration of history could be unlocked. So for example, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania famously said, we must run while others walk. And I've also heard that in 1960s Cameroon, if you went to public offices, it was not too uncommon to find the inscription, be brief, we need to achieve in decades what Europe has achieved over centuries. Um, I'm going to focus on, on Ghana because as the first um, former British colony south of the Sahara to achieve independence and as a beacon of uh, socialism and Pan-Africanism, it really embodied the hopes and expectations of the whole continent in the 60s. And I like to start by um, sharing with you this, I think, beautiful cartoon that was published on, the, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a daily newspaper, the Accra Evening News, on the day of Ghana's independence from Britain, 6 March 1957. It says, marching with the times. And we can clearly see um, what this march was supposed to, to, to lead to, or what, 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 what kind of things uh, were, were Ghanaians expecting from, uh, from independence. Um, so today's paper really consists in uh, an attempt to inscribe different forms of quantification into this march with the times, to reflect on the kind of direction they suggested, but also how they became intertwined with the construction of very different um, forms of political iconography. What does it mean um, to think about temporalities? It's kind of a loose term. And if we start looking for literature on time and temporalities, we see it all over the place, scattered in all disciplines, in anthropology, in philosophy, in linguistics, in history, and so on and so forth. Um, through the lens of, of African studies, there was a very interesting debate, which was started by um, a Kenyan uh, philosopher and an Anglican theologian, and this clearly matters, on what he called the African concept of time. So by studying uh, verb tenses in a small sample of East African languages, John Beatty produced this generalization about the African concept of time, saying that Africans have a sense of a long past, a present, and a limited uh, possibility to conceptualize the far distant future. This came under attack from a variety of perspectives and Ghana somehow became intertwined with this story because the distinguished Ghanaian philosopher Kwame Jeche looked at the Akan concept of time, Bre, and emphasized that actually the concept of Bre entails a, a, the possibility to think of a distant future. And this was before Christianity arrived, which was instead Mbiti's argument that Africans started imagining a distant future only through uh, evangelization. We can see this in expressions like uh, uh, Bresantain, which literally means the raw of time, something that might refer to an indefinite future, or well, even in its plural, uh, Mresantain, which has been translated as, as eternity. However, I'm not concerned here with the theoretical possibility of conceiving a distant future in the abstract. What I'm interested in is about reconstructing state-led representations and narratives of temporalities at two crucial junctures of Ghana's post-colonial history through the lens of quantification. I'm not sure I, I like this expression too much in the sense that I'm, I'm using the word quantification, but really what I mean is a, a set of two very different tools. One is development planning and the other is financial auditing and reporting. So very, very different um, things. Uh, Francois Artog introduced a very, uh, I think, useful distinction between temporality and historicity. Temporality refers to an idea of time that can be measured. It's an idea of time that can be broken up into homogeneous units. It's the realm of clocks and calendars, so to speak. Instead, historicity entails something uh, more elusive and more complex, namely the possibility of weaving narratives that articulate the relationship between the past, the present, and the future. One way of thinking about what I'm going to tell you um, about today is to locate these forms of quantification at the intersection of temporality and historicity. On the one hand, 
they are predicated, even though their main task is not that of measuring time, plans and financial audits embody an idea of time, which typically is linear, it can be measured and so on and so forth. But the point is to follow through the reception and reinvention in the public sphere, how these uh, techniques, these tools of economic management informed very different visions of what we might call historicity. And this is where the connection come with that article that I suggested in connection with today's seminar, that beautiful, I think, article by, by Jane Geyer, um, which starts with a very interesting observation, which is the historical convergence of religious time, as it's perceived and experienced by evangelical Christians, and the macroeconomic time, the deferred promise of growth and prosperity. Uh, the dynamics I'm going to describe, are, to describe are quite different from those discussed by Geyer, because at the center of my story is the state's attempt to represent itself and to project itself through temporal narratives. But the starting point is precisely the, uh, the importance of looking at seemingly different things like a religious iconography and tools of economic management as part of the same historiographical framework. So the first case study is that of the seven year plan for socialist reconstruction and development, which was launched in 1964 and it was cut short in 1966 by the coup that overthrew um, the, the Kwame Nkrumah's uh, government. This plan was supposed to, and we can see this from Nkrumah's own speech when he launched the plan, to build a socialist state, something that will be hailed as the turning point in the history of Ghana, but also as a device to imagine what the future looks like. I say by the end of the plan period, what we'll have is an industrialized nation serving the needs of its people. So Ghana has a long history of planning. So we should not lose sight of the fact that the seven year plan came, um, was one of many experiments, but it was radically different from all those that preceded it because of its scope, because of its ambition, because of its representation of the economy. If, if, through the, the employment of the um, Arab Domar growth model, it was the first plan to have an idea of the economy as a whole, as a tiny little machine that you can um, operate and move around. At the same time though, there is one important commonality between the seven year plan for national reconstruction and development and some of its predecessors, namely that it was planning for a, future, for a future that did not materialize in the way in which it was intended. This being said, how is it that the plan becomes intertwined with the concrete possibility of <coughs> imagining a future? At the most basic level, and also this is the least interesting one, I'd say, is through the conventional grammar of planning, something like this, about production targets, quantifying plenty, quantifying the abundance that eventually would come from it in terms of goods, infrastructures, services, and so on and so forth. But we should not lose sight of the fact that as an artifact, the plan is what it is, namely a huge volume of 200, 300 pages. So how do you convince, how do you explain to people what the plan is about and how it works? And what does this have to do with temporalities? This is where I think this picture is, um, is very revealing. So this is part of a short leaflet the Planning Commission produced for, for popular um, consumption. We clearly get a sense, a, a very specific philosophy of history. We get the idea that poorer countries are those that have a higher percentage of their labor force locked up in agriculture. So this very nice uh, distinction, which I'm sure to many of you will evoke all sorts of things will make you think of Otto Neurath, will make you think of dual economy models and so on and so forth. So from this point of view, it becomes clear that the task of the plan is literally to accelerate history, to shift Ghana from where it currently is closer to the more industrialized countries. But this is one side of the story in the sense that many competing different representation of the plan circulated in Ghanaian society. And uh, it's important to look at other sites like the party press to, to, to think about what was uh, possibly um, at stake here. 
Perhaps a way of thinking as the kind of temporality that is at stake here is the concept introduced by the historian Stephen Anson in relationship with uh, Marxism and with Russia of a charismatic rational time. Uh, obviously, as you can imagine, this kind of merge is an attempt to express his, his dissatisfaction with Max Weber's dichotomous distinction between rational <clears throat> and, charismatic, and charismatic politics. Um, certainly, there is a sense that to project the, the historicity, the importance of, of the plan and its revolutionary potential, this kind of bureaucratic, technocratic, rationalistic discourse is not enough. It's clearly the convergence of two very different, qualitatively different understandings of time. One that is linear and can be measured, and the other that is filled by revolutionary impetus and, and action. We can see this already in the very first draft of the plan. Now, this, this section was removed, uh, which is in itself interesting. So that only a national society nourished from the internal well of revolutionary enthusiasm and based upon the principles of rational organization can be really strong and sound. As soon as we leave the ground of the planning commission and we look at the press, we see that the plan is hailed as the dawn of the socialist paradise. We see that the plan becomes object of poetry. But we also see already in this, uh, in this newspaper headlines that the plan is presented as something that is born of the genius of one man. In other words, is something that became intertwined with specific representations of Kwame Nkrumah as the political uh, leader and as this messianic figure. So we see, for example, here, a common representation of Nkrumah Yosajifo, which literally means the redeemer yeah, in tree, as the good shepherd. We also see that uh, Nkrumahism as a, as a form of political practice and then as, a, as an ideology <coughs> required required different uh, rituals. So for example, these are excerpts from uh, the public meetings that children had as young pioneers, which clearly place Nkrumah outside, not only the linear time, but outside an historical time defined in a very narrow way. Nkrumah never dies, uh, they used to say. And these, um, these sayings acquired deeper connotations after several attempts on Nkrumah's life failed. Uh, I think specifically the one in, in uh, uh, Kurungugu in, in 62. Another example of this charismatic rational time of the attempt to merge what uh, seem different realms within this new um, set of political iconographies is this other um, example in which nature itself seems to participate to the launching of the plan and to the, to, to, to the opening of this revolutionary and possibly messianic era. That unrelated and yet related, they synchronize the tornado revolutionary energy that the plan as introduced by the leader represented in a series of earthquakes, thunderclaps and stormy torrential cloud bursts which followed cannot be forgotten and so on and so forth. Heavy rain, the first in several months, water the thirsty earth after the tremor thought already related to action. So we saw these things coming together when the plan is launched. A dream of happiness come through in seven years of hard work and sacrifice. Now, this was the discourse. Did the plan work out in practice? If we listen to um, Douglas Rimmer, who was uh, one of the most free market development economists of the era, he called the, the, the plan was a piece of paper with an operational impact close to zero. And development economists have argued what were the reasons uh, for which the plan failed to design the economy in its own shape. Uh, of course, we cannot forget the fact that cocoa prices were going really down. So the attempt to diversify the economy was uh, already facing quite a formidable uh, bottleneck and there were other issues. But I personally don't like this kind of narrative too much. Rather, I don't think it tells the whole story. It's not a black and white story. It's not that the plan, I mean, the plan did not transform Ghana the way it was intended, but that also because of the coup, right, which took place after less than two years that the plan was launched. But this does not imply that the plan did not have a real impact on people's perceptions of the state and people's relationship with the state. 
And there's this beautiful document that I post here, which we can interpret as an attempt by the people to mobilize the rhetoric of uh, Nkrumahism, potentially for their own benefits. So this is about people uh, using uh, funds to celebrate the anniversary of the state corporations and the state farms, which the plan itself had put at the center of this rising uh, economic, economic order, which I think is quite interesting because temporality, although in its calendrical rather than messianic um, dimension, is what allows the articulation of this, of this agency. Still, regardless, the coup took place on 24 February, 1966, and we have a very different political order. One of a giant of men from the military and the police who called themselves the National Liberation Council and who stayed in power for three years until 1969. They used quantification too, massively, to project a new vision of what the state was supposed to be. But first of all, what they had to do was to dismantle what they perceived as Nkrumah's cult. So in the popular press, we see that Nkrumah is no longer represented as this messianic figure, but rather as this, uh, well, in this case, naked man praying in front of a juju shrine. Uh, which was quite a radical difference from the, from the representation, so from the iconography of Nkrumah that we saw earlier as the, as the redeemer, as the good shepherd, and so on and so forth. But even in this case, we see a concern with the political calendar. So we see from this document here, for example, that they, they had an issue. The anniversary of Ghana's independence from Britain is 6 March, the day of the coup is 24 February. In order to promote, to inscribe more forcefully their own revolution, as they called it, in the political calendar of the nation, they went as far as to say that the festivity for the 10th anniversary of Ghana's independence should be somehow subdued, marked merely by church services and so on and so forth. Because the new real date is 24 February no longer the 6th of March. However, the quantification played a huge role in creating the iconography of the NLC, but this is no longer the word of the plan of the, of, of the nation that marches together under the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah. It's a word that uses commissions of inquiry as its main tool, both of knowing, of quantifying, and of projecting a new idea of what the state is about. This is just a sample of the volumes that I collected, but we know that there were at least around 70 new advisory bodies in charge for finding out about all sorts of things, from uh, management practices in state corporations to constitutional reform, um, and so on and so forth. So this is clearly a very different culture of quantification. Um, I like to pause for a second here and invoke two very useful ideas. The first by power, when he talks about um, the audit culture and audit societies, these are and financial auditing as being rituals of verification that operationalize regulatory hopes and aspirations. And I like to focus on the ritual um, part of it. The second is the relationship once again, between the mere numbers, the sheer numbers of the plan, or in this case, of the commissions of inquiry, and the broader narrative circulation about the state. And here Stoller, uh, studying uh, colonial um, uh, commissions of inquiry, said, if statistics help determine the character of social facts, it is commissions that provide the interpretive historical and epistemic frames. And this is exactly what we're going um, to see. So this might be rituals of verification, but my argument is that they depended crucially on other rituals. The first is the ritual of enumeration, of just finding out. And for me, one of the biggest surprises after going through some of these commissions of inquiry, I'm still going through them, I just started uh, scraping the surface of, uh, of these thousands of, uh, of, of pages, is the incredible amount of detail. 
Suddenly we have a world that is not uh, no longer concerned with the contribution of agriculture or industry to national development, but with what specific individuals did. You can see the case, for example, of Mr. Regala, who someone who occupied different uh, ministerial position in, uh, in Krumah's government, reconstructing how much he spent on laundry, how much he spent on cleaning products and so on and so forth. The amount of detail is absolutely incredible. So this obsessive enumeration is one of the first features of these new uh, rituals of quantification, so to speak. The second is that of interrogation. And this is where we clearly get the sense that numbers cannot speak by themselves from that point of view uh, through this. Uh, this is one of my favorite, the Ghana Academy of, um, of Sciences. What was, uh, um, at stake here was the sale of some flacons of uh, Pfizer-made uh, uh, teramycin, and about the storekeeper was being interrogated as to how they, they, they come to the price at which they sold it and whether or not he had the authorization to do what he did and so on and so forth. So on the one end, we start seeing that this stops being about the numbers, but rather discussing the numbers, like how, do you, how did you derive the price of those flacons and why did you sell them, why did you sell them at that price? is an entry point into all sorts of things. It's an entry point into the internal political economy of the state corporations of these institutions like the Ghana Academy of Sciences. But there's also uh, something more. There seems to be, um, I mean, some of, some of these commissions of inquiry are beautiful. You suddenly bump into a dialogue like this that could read like Beckett or, or UNESCO. And the more they get into the details of the financial regulations of the accounting practices, the more you get the sense that the state and the people who are being interrogated speak to incompatible languages. So I think it's actually quite revealing that they go on for 20 pages um, interrogating uh, the storekeeper. And then he tries somehow said, uh, you know, I did approach him and the same particular thing was concerned. Said, what, and then and, and, and the, um, the person asking the question says, what are you answering? What question are you answering? And the same thing is suspended on this question. Last but not least, uh, from interrogation follows confession. So uh, once again, a reminder of how different the social ontology of the representation of the state in the press was. Once again, it's no longer about the plan marching together towards a bright future. It's about people confessing to what they've done. I selected only a few, but there's a much longer list of articles that will begin that presented the results of this commission of inquiry always in this form. I did this, I received this money, um, I took it away, I sent it abroad, and so on and so forth. At the same time, this is um, matched by new public rituals. So the court, both as a physical and a metaphorical place, becomes the site of embodiment of this military government's uh, perception of its own mission, of its own fate. And this came with its own protocols. So for example, there was this debate on Ghanaian newspapers as to whether or not the people watching the trials could express their disappointment and scream and hoot. And the, news, the, state, <coughs> the state press defended this behavior, said hooting does not harm or injure. Therefore, um, incentivizing the people who watch the trial to actually uh, to make known how, how disgusted they were with the conduct of the, probe, of the previous um, regime and people associated with it. So uh, what we get is a very different iconographical representation of the state. The first thing that should be noticed is that the men of the National Liberation Council are never represented. They're represented in pictures, but never in cartoons. Instead, cartoons that represent what the state is supposed to be doing is always in the form of a judge. Um, from this point of view, there is perhaps an analogy with Nkrumahist political representation. And that is that both Nkrumahist political representation and the one under the NLC relied heavily on the rhetorical figure of the uh, synecdoche. So they represent the whole, which could be the state of the government, through a part. In the case of Nkrumah's regime, it was through the personification of the leader. It was through the plan as a, as a, um, the plan as a symbol of what Ghana is, but more importantly, what it could have become. While in the case of the NLC, the state is always a judge. This does not imply that there was not a utopian spirit behind this. Uh, now, 
perhaps I should clarify this. By utopia, I don't mean a detailed blueprint of a perfect state of affairs. I mean an impulse to reimagine some, to reimagine and to rearticulate the boundary between what is feasible and what is not. And this is where we see other interesting uh, representations. This is where we see interesting references to time again, sometimes in the most unexpected of places. For example, this verse, time's glories to calm contending kings to unmask falsehood and bring truth to light. Those of you who like uh, Shakespeare will have recognized this verse, but then somehow it appears in the report of the commission appointed to inquire into the affairs of the Ghana Timber Marketing Board. So sometimes under the cascades of numbers that go on and on and on for hundreds of pages, we see a literary um, ephemera like this that makes us reflect as to what is at stake here. I want to conclude with two representations. The first one is the consumer goods released from the market. It's really a, a play on the fact that the political detainees that have been arrested under Nkrumah were released, this issue of the, of the, but also the return possibly of prosperity, of goods in theory being available again. In practice, it was not, it was not that, uh, that straightforward. Although this was a huge display on part of the regime who used the military to release the hoarded goods and sell them at controlled prices and whatever. The other one on the other side of the screen, we see this frog puking, puking back the money that had disappeared, you can get back into the state treasury's coffin, which uh, if what we're concerned with is the iconography of the state, then it's a quite, quite a radical departure because we have moved from the eschatological representation of socialism to a scatological representation of a state that seems to exhaust this function into bringing back, into returning what had been uh, taken. Perhaps an idea of utopia which is not necessarily forward looking, but is rather closer to the one described by um, Isaiah Berlin, that utopia is the notion of the broken unity and its reconstitution. So where does this um, leave us? This sums up a bit the kind of radical differences between the CPP government under Nkrumah and the NLC military government into how they, through quantification and through temporalities, they produced an image of themselves and they projected it onto the public and they disseminated it through the press. What at stake though, leaving aside the specific case of Ghana, is an attempt to reflect precisely on these different connections. There is an Akan uh, dirge saying a funeral that says, no one reigns forever on the throne of time. The point is to understand how those who reign at different points in time produce temporal narratives to justify their, um, their existence. There are some further implications, I think, uh, some broader, hopefully, um, historiographical implications that go beyond the case of Ghana. The first is where do we look when we look for the politics of numbers? And uh, it seems to me that looking at how the actual numbers were constructed takes us only so far. What we need to think is also how these numbers were explained and interpreted and communicated. The second is these different connections from the political regimes that I studied to regimes of quantification, which were pretty uh, clear, to this bifurcation. Into on the one end, regimes of historicity, to use uh, uh, Francois Artaud's expression. So, through numbers, through the presentation of numbers, what is at stake here is no longer the state of the Ghanaian economy. It's something much, much broader. It's the justification of the legitimacy of a state of affairs and of a, and of a, particular, and of a particular state. Uh, and lastly, there's been lots of interesting discussions on the nature of utopianism on the one end and on the post-colony as a political space on the other end. It seems to me that studies of quantification can actually raise all sorts of interesting questions as to how the utopian is conceived in particular points in, in time and, and place. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Gerardo, for sharing your work with us. Um, so I just wanted to come in on one of the last things you said to follow up with a query. Um, you sort of made a point about the state 
as judge. And I was wondering, just in terms of, if you can pick out a bit, any particularities about the role of economics and social sciences in particular over other forms of expertise like law or engineering or other realms of knowledge, because at least um, in the sort of earlier, um, uh, in the earlier regime that you were describing, which was more, which was in a sort of development plan framework, the, um, the work that I've done on the World Bank in the 50s and 60s on development planning, uh, but there's a huge contestation about which is the relevant domain of knowledge and the economic knowledge and economics itself is subsidiary to engineering and law. And I'm just wondering if there is a contestation of that kind and, uh, and if you could just draw out anything particular about economics um, as a discipline. Yes, I mean, that's, that, that, that's a fantastic question. Uh, one of the things that I try to show in some of my earlier work is precisely the crucial importance of economists and economics in the making of uh, Nkrumah's um, government, but precisely through the plurality of ways in which this came through. So the economists were those who drafted the plan, and there is a very interesting Cold War um, story here, people coming from the East, people coming from the West, and somehow settling on the Arodoma growth model as something that can travel easily, to use an expression that is dear to, to Mary Morgan, this kind of template that can kind of cross the ideological boundaries. At the same time, though, the less known side of the story, at least as far as the history of economic thought um, community is concerned, it's of course a well-known story to historians of Ghana, is the importance of economists in articulating also internal um, discussions as to what Nkrumahism actually is. And this is where we see different economists. For example, there's those at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute which who talk of Marxism, Leninism, Nkrumahism, and they teach lots of labor theory of value. You've got Polish economists at the University of Ghana who make them read, who make students read Kaletsky and Oscar Lange and so on and so forth. So there's, there's all these different things um, coming together. There is also, the issue, one of the, I think one of the most fascinating instances of uh, using Marxism to express dissent, which is, I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic uh, story, that of Joseph H. Mensah, who was a Ghanaian economist, who was one of the key people behind the development plan, but he was not very happy with the way things were going, and yet there was lots of tension with Kwame Nkrumah. So after he became appointed president of the Ghanaian Economic Society, the Economic Society of Ghana, he gave his presidential speech in which he basically called the relevance of Marxism for Ghanaian development planning, um, in which he basically showed that if we have to take Marx seriously, we need to emphasize the historicity of his thought, and therefore Marx is not as relevant as our politician tell us he is, and we don't have time to waste on class struggle and things like this. We cannot afford it because the call to development is too urgent to spend time discussing this. He was attacked in the party press by other economists, by Samuel Ikoku, who was a Nigerian, a Nigerian um, economist who, took a, who played a huge role in the, the Spark, which was a part, one of the party magazines and at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological, Ideological Institute. Um, under the NLC, it's not that economists become less important. They had a plan. They had a two-year development plan. It's just that in the press, in the way in which the state tries to tell the people what they're doing, it doesn't figure so prominently. It's all about the commissions of, of inquiry. And there are still many economists involved, the World Bank economists, but in this case, is how to pay off the debt that Ghana had accumulated rather than how to diversify the economy and uh, lead it to this, uh, to this, um, to this aspect. Okay, I do have some more queries, but I'll, I think we should open it up and um, invite people to come forward with questions. I know there was something posted in the chat, but I can let Cleo take over now. Yeah, um, yeah okay. so, uh, so you can either ask a question um, in the chat and I can read it, if, or if you prefer, you could just uh, ask it yourself. So I'm sorry for the pronunciation, 
um, Noble Naza or Noble Naza have a question? You could uh, unmute yourself and ask the question or just. Yes. Um, so my question is relating to a portion where Gerardo mentions that when um, planning hits the ground, it becomes poetry and no longer you know, stays in the realm of quantification. Um, I believe there is a necessity to that sort of approach, right? And um, having lived in Ghana and observed how Nkrumah's personality has been maligned for so long, I think he is misrepresented and misunderstood in what he was trying to do. So if you take a look at uh, Mantia Diawaris in, in Search of Africa, where he interviews the Guinean writer, William Sassin, at a point in the conversation, William Sassin makes a very important point. He says that we have lost the meaning of myth in Africa. And by myth, he did not mean superstition or legends, but something larger, bigger than life, something of epic dimensions, something that connects us or gives us a sense of continuity with the past and a vision of the future, right? Poetry in itself derives from the word prophecy. And that is to see into the future. So I believe that what Inkubo was trying to achieve, you know, it's something larger, something mythological. And I believe most countries that have become prosperous today have national mythologies, you know, and they may not be founded in reality, you know, but then it shows a vision of what the future should be like. So I think that looking at it purely through the realm of quantification, we may be losing the larger picture of what you know, such epic narratives or, or mythologies could achieve in the country. I wonder if um, um, Gerardo can speak to that. Thank you. Thank you, Noble. That's a wonderful question. And uh, I suspect one of the many conversations we'll have, we'll have about this. Um, I, completely, I completely agree with you. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, that economists have done a disservice just by looking at the performance of the plan, rather than on the one hand, it's symbolic meaning, but on the other hand, how also it opened up spaces for, uh, for agency and, uh, and negotiation. Um, and that is why I think this is something that I've heard lots of times in Ghana and elsewhere, and I'm sure so have you, that what made Nkrumah stand out for, from others is that he had a vision, not only for his country, but also for, um, for the continent as a whole. And this dimension of planning could also be pushed in this direction, right? The beautiful pages you write in Africa Must Unite about the continental plan and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. At the same time though, I think we should, uh, uh, and this is where the job of the historian is, is particularly tricky, given how loaded memories of Nkrumah are, depending on where you go, right? Uh, it's to draw the distinction between Nkrumah as an individual, as an intellectual, as, an, as, a, as, as a prophet of African unity, if you want to use that expression, or as a poet of African unity, given that two things are related, and Nkrumahism. So it's not, I presented one tiny bit of the story, but obviously much more could be said as to how Nkrumah's own ideas are then translated not only into policies, but into um, iconography. And that in itself contains all sorts of internal power struggles. What was happening at the Theological Institute? What was happening at the Spark? You have people fighting for all sorts of reasons and then appealing to some things that maybe Nkrumah said or meant to advance their own agenda. And then in the historical record, the two things get uh, somehow intertwined and it's difficult to disentangle. But I completely agree with you that we should not lose sight of the symbolic meaning and the mythical potential of, 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 the, of these elements. I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, more. Thanks. Uh, Raf, have a question, I think? Uh, yes, can, can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, Gerardo for the presentation. I think it was very, very uh, fascinating. And, um, and I found particularly interesting how uh, using the theme of temporalities, you're able to uh, sort of cut through very different uh, political and institutional uh, moments of, of Ghana. And I think that is, is, is very fascinating. And also the idea of uh, looking into not just <laughs> what the plan did in terms of numbers, but what the plan did in terms of symbologies and the way in which it was uh, uh, perceived in a broader uh, public sphere, we could say. And, and I was very fascinated by how you showed also 
and, and, and this is where my, my question is, how you show that um, the state was represented together with different moments of this story, right? So um, I would like to push you a little bit more in this direction. And so asking you uh, how this story about temporalities you think can help us uh, uh, think about or maybe try to reconstruct how uh, the, the idea of the state changed through time. And, uh, and I'm wondering whether you would, uh, uh, you would like to uh, maybe use, if you think this would be a, a sort of an appropriate uh, kind of way to frame uh, the issue is if you think that the idea of uh, an impersonal state of a sort of an impersonal authority, and this comes to me from the uh, representation of the state as a judge, right? Um, if, if you think that this, this idea is something that could be useful to try and cut across uh, all of these developments. But thank you, thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you, that's, that's a great question. Um, I must say, I mean, I tried to, 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 to read uh, as much as I could about, about what does it mean to, to think of the state. And, and for, some, for some reason, the, uh, the definition that's really stayed with me is the one provided by David Graeber say so that the state is simultaneously, inevitably, both a system of extraction and a utopian project. So I actually think that in its simplicity, that's, that's where the, the, the core of the issue is, to think about the interplay of, this, of, these two, of these two aspects. Now, the issue of to say of the impersonal versus personal, you're absolutely right in saying that the judge, even the judge is never a specific individual, right? It's just a judge. It's a symbol of the judge, it's a symbol of the, judiciary, which in itself was becoming a bit contested. Because for example, after the coup, lots of uh, chiefs and traditional authorities were asking for more judiciary powers and the government said no, or there were criticism about the fact that so many of the advisees chosen by the governments were, were lawyers, um, for example, in the Constitutional Commission, although that, that kind of makes sense and, and so on and so forth. However, uh, the reason why this is complicated is that the NLC performs also a very different operation. So looks at this, for example, from a, from a pamphlet the, in which the, the NLC presents the individuals composing it. And this is how they present themselves to the public. So there is an inversion of the Nkrumah's trope of elevating the leader. They're trying to say, look, we are real individuals. We are one of you. It's a form of, I don't know if you want to call it populism. So it's like, uh, I don't know, uh, it's a pleasant baritone voice. It's sung in choirs and choral society for over 15 years. Uh, he plays an occasional game of table tennis. These were not people to be, to be messed up with. Huh? So I've, I've always found this incredibly fascinating of how the head of the police or top people in the army would choose to publish these pamphlets in which they reveal this kind of stuff about themselves. Precisely, I guess, to invert the tropic of the messianic representation that had prevailed until un until then. Thanks. Um, that answers your question, but I think it points maybe somewhere. So Alexia, yes, have a question and then Andres. So Alex, yeah. Hi, hi Gerardo. Um, so I think I have a, a, a kind of a, a historian's fiddly question. Um, so one of them was about, I, I really appreciate this contrast you had between sort of moving from the plan to the commission, right? Um, when you use Stoller to do that. And so my question, my initial question, which actually kind of dovetails with the previous one, so you can maybe um, just build that a little bit, was about, you know, if the time of planning seems a little bit kind of intuitive to us now, right? Futurity, expected futures, et cetera. What is, what is the time or the temporality of the commission? Um, because it also seems like the types of things that you were interested in shift a lot between those two, the types of quantification shift a lot between those two things. So maybe it's not a perfect parallel, um, but it, it, uh, so if you can ignore that maybe, and then I'll ask another part of the question, which was like in the, in the initial, early in the presentation, you, you look at the succession of plans, right? This deep history of planning um, in Ghana. And, and it immediately occurred to me that an interesting thing that must happen, and you can just tell us if it's interesting throughout that process is, is how these plans deal with the failed futures that preceded them. <laughs> um, so as they keep recycling planning, is there any effort to actually reflect on sort of the act of planning and 
what wasn't accomplished before, what will become different now and how that sort of feeds into maybe a more complex sense of like, what is the time of, of the plan? Um, so if, if those make some sense, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you very much. Um, these are great questions. Uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is a series of things that, that could be said. Uh, I'll try to keep it uh, uh, concise. Uh, one is, well, there is no straight answer because some plans were more reflective than others, so to speak. And the later plans for the very fact that there were more voluminous attempts to make sense of the economy, there is a better sense of the past performances of, uh, of the plan. If we have to extrapolate a trend, which is something that historians of, uh, of Africa have noticed again and again, is that in the 1920s, these plans are not really plans the way we would imagine them. They're rather, I think they call them a shopping list approaches. So they're lists of expenditure, sometimes cost of different ministries. There is, uh, what is lacking is a sense of unity, the sense that there is such a thing as the economy, this, a more complex sense of the interdependencies between different sectors and how they might reflect on each other, which is something that we see, uh, which becomes more prominent through the, the incorporation of new statistical frameworks, aside from the 50s and the provision of national income accounts and all this kind of stuff. But your question about the time of the plan, makes me think of something else, because you're absolutely right uh, when you say that clearly the plan is something future oriented, but even there, there are hidden layers of meaning. So the first is why seven years, right? This, is, this was this decision that was taken after um, Krumah's tour to the Soviet Union. The USSR was doing a seven year plan at the time. So it was in itself a form of tribute to this alternative way of thinking, even though in its technical features, the plan was not a Soviet style plan, it was not a Soviet style plan, there's still this issue. The second aspect, and this goes back to the plan as this potentially utopian thing in so far as it draws, as try to alters the link between what is possible and what is not at the given point in time. This is evidence from the World Bank archives in Washington, and you have the World Bank economists telling you a very different story. So it's, given that Ghana is an agricultural economy, they shouldn't even think about planning for seven years. It's too much. They cannot afford to dream over such a long period. Instead, if they want industrialization, it might happen in the sense of deferral, but it will be after this plan. It should not be this plan. It will be the next one and so on and so forth. And this is, I think it's an important way of reappropriating what is, this goes back to what Noble was saying, kind of the political and mythical aspect of the plan when we see it, uh, within this broader framework. You're also absolutely right about the potential mismatch between the plan and the commission. And in that sense though, that's a choice I make because I could have either studied planning throughout the regimes or the commissions of inquiry throughout the regimes. And instead I said, no, let me be guided by what the magazine and the press says, what are they talking about? And there is a clear continuity because even though uh, defenders of uh, the NLC said that the government was much more democratic. Things were not exactly like that. This was still an authoritarian regime. The press was still in the hands of the state, more or less, even though there were calls to privatize newspapers, they were still in the hands of the government. Uh, so there was a faint sense of opening, but there was this conversation with this, with, that I read about with this journalist. When someone asked the journalist, so what happens if under the NLC you praise Nkrumah? What happens then? And the guy said, well, we don't know because we don't want to try. There's no point in risking it. So uh, this thing of how the state somehow continues to exercise an influence on what gets published. It's a matter of degree, but, uh, but it, it's a wonderful question. Thank you. So we have um, maybe some times for um, the two last question. Um, and we're sorry, maybe we'll take some five, five minutes um, after the time. Andres um, had a question, so maybe you could unmute yourself and ask it. Yes. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Gerardo, for this wonderful uh, talk. Uh, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm also working myself on, on planning in Colombia in the 1960s, and I see some very interesting parallels, for example. Um, it, I, I, uh, the people I interview who worked in this period often speak about some mysticism, the, the mystica of working in the planning department and the idea that they were changing the country from the planning office. So I think that's an element that we cannot miss from this story. And 
and the, the lens of temporality you give to these sort of um, propositions is quite interesting. Uh, my question relates to, um, to perhaps the different conflicts of uh, timing and temporality within the making of the plan, within, for example, the commission, or in the, the Colombian case, the National Planning Department, because I see a constant struggle between defining these long-term goals, um, which, as you mentioned, ha have an element of utopianism, and a more short-term constraints. So to what extent do you think that this uh, the dichotomy between the short-term development and long, and, and uh, sorry, long-term development and short-term uh, constraints are also construed in the process of developing the plan? Uh, because what I see is, is that often these people who are involved in making these plans uh, complain about the fact that they cannot focus on long-term development goals uh, because uh, they need to build the statistics, for example, uh, to address short-term uh, imbalances. Um, and they need to coordinate with other ministries and other state actors uh, in order to, to, to address short-term issues in order to be able to focus on, on long-term goals. So what, what can you say about this conflicts of temporality as well uh, within the makers of the plan, the, the planners themselves. How can you perceive that in, uh, in the Ghanaian case? And, um, and what, what do you say, what, what do you think it, it implies for your understanding of the temporality of planning? Thank you very much. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I must say due to the nature of this, uh, of this project, I was more interested in how the plan was projected rather than opening the black box of the planning commission. I'm still working through the documents, kind of the minutes of the, um, of the internal discussion, but uh, from what I've seen, what you suggest is a very, very common problem, uh, which of course takes different forms. One narrative that emerges, I don't know if that's the case also in the Colombian case, is the clash between the politicians and the economists. So talking, going back to Alexa's point about the plants being abandoned the, the, you know, in, the, in the 50s, uh, shortly after independence, uh, William Arthur Lewis was, of course, the, the financial advisor of, of, of Kwame Nkrumah. And he left the country in a state of deep uh, frustration because he felt that people did not listen to him. And this was also a story about what is wanted at a given point in time and potentially about temporalities, about what politicians thought were uh, solid investment, also in terms of political capital to keep people happy versus what the economist tells you is, is feasible. And if you read um, uh, Lewis' um, politics in West Africa, he's, he hints at, uh, um, at, this kind of, at this kind of issues. The issue of statistics and the statistical basis, that's, that's interesting because the plan was received in different ways. So there were economists, like some of these people at the World Bank who emphasized the seeming unfeasibility or dreamlike quality of it, but others who instead, who instead thought that it was really quite impressive, especially if we compare them with plans produced by other West African states in the same period. If we look, for example, at the plan, at the plan made by uh, Guinea under Secouture, the plan done by uh, Mali under Modibo Keita, even though they involved uh, lots of really smart economists, right? Samir Amin, uh, Charles Bettelin, and, and all these people, right? Kind of, uh, uh, still, there was a sense that the Ghanaian plan was much more empirically grounded because the country had a better statistical basis to start with compared to some of its other, of its other things. But that, that's certainly an interesting dimension. I should look into it more, into how this clash of temporalities is brought in into the planning, uh, into the planning commission. I must also say, though, that for me, uh, working on the plan, especially during my first um, field trip to Ghana was a bit of a disappointment because I was hoping to find lots of this material of internal minutes that would explain what was happening inside the planning commission. And eventually I found some, but not as much as I wanted to. And by that time I already decided I wanted to do something else, but I'll go back to it. So thanks a lot. That's a useful suggestion. Um, so we'll have to take a last question and I will read it. I'm sorry, Federico, but I know you can't uh, ask a small question. Uh, so Federico asks, did the Ghanaians uh, believe in their myth? Um, and I will ask you to be sort of uh, uh, brief. 
<laughs> Federico, that, that, that's a really low blow. I, I cannot, I cannot be brief about that. And uh, and uh, <laughs> I promise to call you after this is over and tell you all about it. The question is, it depends. It depends both in terms of time, given that uh, I think it's fair to say that support from Krumah's government was higher in say 1958-59 than it was by 1965, but it also varies hugely across state. So what uh, market women or civil servants would tell you would be completely different from what businessmen or people in the Asante region might tell you. Uh, that, that's the shortest I can be, clear. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we're five minutes late already, so we, we're going to um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerardo and uh, everyone uh, on, the, on the seminar for coming. Uh, just um, a reminder, we have a seminar, the next one is in two weeks, uh, 6th of April, uh, with Clint Sobildan uh, in conversation with Diane Cole. Um, so that's it. Thanks uh, a lot. And I give you, if you have a last word, you could, you could uh, be the one finishing the, the seminar. Uh, no, thanks. That was great. Thanks okay. a lot. <laughs> okay.